So in section 1.2, we're going to talk about data sampling and then some variation among that. And so for data, we talked a little bit about that before. And there's uh, two types, qualitative data, which is what we called um, categorical, and then quantitative data, which is what we called numerical or measurable. So qualitative data, if we're looking at a favorite color, might be something like red. Quantitative data, if we're looking at something like weight, it might be 140 pounds. And data has two main types. Uh, there's a discrete data. And so if you could for me just uh, out loud, go ahead and count to five. So notice you when you counted, you probably went one, two, three, four, five. You didn't say one, 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3. So discrete data is those counting numbers. Uh, whole numbers. If we're going to pull people, you're not going to end up with 6.7 people. You're either going to have 6 or you're going to have 7. Continuous data is something that flows so uh, where you are allowed to have those intermediate values. So for example, if you're putting gas in your car, you're not going to go from 1 gallon to 2. It slowly fills up from one all the way up to two, getting every single value in between. So it's a continuous flow. And let's look at some ways to organize that data that we get. One way is uh, to make uh, pictorial diagrams here. And you've probably looked at pie charts before. So this is a nice way to organize some data. Now for pie charts, it should add up to 100% because the categories are disjoint here. And so we have uh, whole categories adding up to the whole entire pie. And we typically look at percentages when we're talking at pie charts. Another way is looking at bar graphs. Again, you're probably familiar with these. Notice that this graph here does go, uh, it doesn't add up to 100%. That's fine because the groups do not have to be disjoint. That means you could be in one or the other group as well or in multiple groups. Let's kind of look at these uh, fairly quickly here. If uh, we looked at a pie chart and we also looked at a uh, bar graph, so this is the same data, but if I ask the question of uh, which college has more full-time students here, so which college has more full-time students, what we see is that uh, if we're looking at the pie charts, Foothill would seem to have more because we have about 71.4 uh, versus 59.1 there. But if we look at the actual frequency here, the actual values, we see that Foothill only has a little bit over 4,000 and De Anza has a little bit over 9,000. So there's some pros and cons when we're looking at uh, the proportions, percentages versus the actual count. And so when we have groups that are different sizes, it's very convenient to look at the proportions, percentages of those. Um, but we want to make sure that uh, we use in a, the appropriate taking so it's something is not misleading. So just to be aware of that. A Pareto chart is another type of graph here. And a Pareto chart is something that organizes things in a descending order. So it starts from high to low, just so it's easy on the eye. And a pie chart is actually a, a Pareto chart. And uh, it actually goes counterclockwise. So we start at the top, kind of at the 12 o'clock position and go counterclockwise. And again, this one is organized with percentages. Uh, nice uh, labels, uh, and it's just very clean to see. Sampling, so how do we actually get this data initially? We have to talk about getting a sample, and so a couple of different ways. Uh, one of the first techniques is to use a simple random sampling, and this is what we refer to as the lottery case. 
So uh, you give everyone a raffle ticket, you put them in a hat, you shake it up, and then you kind of pull from there. Now, that's a little uh, a little bit uh, uh, ancient way of really pulling a random sample. With today's technology, we have more sophisticated ways of doing that. In my class, if I wanted to do a random sample, I have everyone's name in an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, there's a number assigned to everyone, and I could have a computer program randomly generate and draw a number there. But in the simplest case, you could think of it as kind of the lottery case. But everyone has an equal likely chance of being selected here. Another type of sampling is stratified sampling. And so this breaks up the population into uh, groups. And then what we do is we select from every single group. So if I wanted to go ahead and sample some statistics classes, I might break it up into classes. Then I go to each class and I sample five students. Um, and we typically do it proportionately. So if it's a double with more students, I might select more students from there. Cluster sampling is very similar to that, where it also breaks up the population into um, uh, smaller groups. And then uh, from there, we end up selecting some of these subgroups, so we take everyone within there. So for example, if I'm sampling statistics classes, I break everything up into classes. Then I'll go and I'll select a couple classes, but I select everyone within that section. Now, these two methods, you want to break up uh, the population into groups that are probably already done in, in a certain way. Uh, that makes it a lot easier. So again, stratified, you select from each group, where a cluster, you select entire groups, and you don't necessarily pick at each single group. Systematic is another way to sample. And this is where you have a starting point, then you select every kind of nth person, so every, you know, fifth person, every tenth person. If you're going to go ahead and do a, a polling and you have a list of addresses, you might just say, I'm going to start at this house and then I'll go every tenth house after that. So systematic sampling. And one way that is probably um, used more often than it should is going to be convenience sampling here. This is not technically a random sampling. Uh, there are ways to kind of alter it, but you're really just asking whoever is uh, convenient or at your disposal here. So if I wanted to sample statistics students, I would probably just ask my class because it's easy for me to gather that data. We also want to talk about replacement and without replacement. So if we were drawing marbles from a bag that had, you know, three red marbles and two green marbles, Every time I select a red marble, I'm going to have less and less if I'm not putting them back. And so the probability of getting a red marble uh, starts diminishing. It gets lower and lower. Well, if we have a huge population, that's really not a big deal. So there is a difference when we're selecting with replacement or without. But usually in a large population, if you're selecting one marble out of a million, it doesn't really make a big difference uh, that you took one out or not. We also want to talk about sampling errors and non-sampling errors. So a sampling error is anything that's done with the sample. So the technique that you use to sample, whether a sample was enlarged enough, so specifically related to that sample. A non-sampling error might be something that's associated with kind of the methodology of it or, or perhaps the um, kind of like a technical error. So if we're using a certain device that malfunctioned, um, so things of that nature we would call a, a non-sampling error. And it's important to know that there is variation among the data. So even if there's a machine that is putting uh, 16 ounces of a juice in a certain can, well, it's possible it's not going to get exactly 16. It might get a little bit less. It might get a little bit more. So there is that variation that's there. Ultimately, what we're going to want to do in this class is to see if, if that variation is acceptable, if it's close enough to 16 ounces 
where we could say that machine is functioning properly or if it's varying too much, where we would say that it's not functioning properly. But you wanna be aware of just some variation. And some critical evaluation here. We wanna be cautious also how we get our samples, some things associated with that. So I'll go over some examples, but fairly quickly, bias samples. If there's an agenda, a certain group, uh, if you are in a group, you know, Democrats for California, they might have a slight agenda versus Republicans for uh, Texas. So uh, make sure that there's not a hidden agenda whenever we talk about, uh, whenever we get our sampling. So bias sampling there. If I want to find out if uh, people prefer to read the movie or the book, but I'm sampling outside a movie theater, that might kind of alter my results. Uh, Self-selection and non-response. You've probably done this walking through the quad at school where someone asks you, do you have time for the survey? And you just kind of say, no, I, I got to get to class. Or if they catch you and you say, do you have time for you know the environment and you're really into the environment, you might say, yes, I'm going to go ahead and make time for that. So self-selection and non-responsive could kind of... Uh, select just a certain part of the population or exclude a certain part, uh, uh, part as well. Loaded questions are going to be things that are, maybe the questions are a little bit guided. So they're kind of uh, telling you, uh, you know, uh, guiding you in a certain direction. And then, of course, misleading data. So some kind of improper use of data. So let's look at uh, here. So some potential pitfalls with these kind of loaded questions here. And notice here it says, should the president have the uh, line item vetoed to eliminate waste? And that's the key difference here, that this one, they're actually telling you, uh, you know, it's to eliminate waste. And you might not really read the questions. If you eliminate waste, you're going to vote for that, as opposed to if they don't give any more information here. And I've done this with, uh, uh, with my son where, you know, we go to the pizza parlor and it's pretty expensive. I don't want to spend all of that money. So I'll ask them, where do you want to go? To the pizza parlor? Or do you want to go to the park where you met those friends the other day? So I'm kind of giving them that extra information to kind of persuade their decision there. Here's another example where if we're talking about uh, air pollution, but in the first case, they talk about um, uh, if we have... Uh, uh, traffic or industry, and then in the second case, they reverse it where they say industry first and then traffic. So depending what you put first, typically people might be favored to select that since we're talking about pollution. So the order of things kind of uh, also could kind of help to that loaded question there. We also want to be cautious with kind of uh, at misleading use of data here. And so these are just some made up numbers here. But let's say for an example, in 1990, you have a thousand people that played paintball and we had 50 injuries. That's only a 5% injury level. Well, let's say a couple decades later, it's more popular. Now we have a million people playing paintball with 200 reported injuries. Well, that's only a 0.02, not even a percent of injuries there. So the question here, is paintball getting safer or more dangerous? Now, if we look at those percentages, it's pretty obvious that we are going down. So it seems like it's going safer. But if we look at the actual number of people, well, from 50 to 200, that's a 400% increase. And there's a saying, there are lies, there are damn lies, and then there are statistics. <laughs> so we want to be a little cautious with that. Uh, so uh, for every set of data, you could always kind of make an argument for and against there. Uh, what we should be looking at is the actual percentages, not the actual amount, because if there's more population, we would expect there's more of everything there. Another pitfall is you also want to uh, be cautious when we do conclusions, when we start looking at uh, two variables. So, for example, if we go to death row and we ask inmates if they like hamburgers, 
Well, I'm pretty sure a lot are going to probably say they like hamburgers. So then could I conclude that eating hamburgers will make you kill somebody? And we're not allowed to do that. Uh, you know, there's a correlation. There's a relationship there. But mostly everyone likes hamburgers, right? Uh, so a lot of people like hamburgers. So we want to be very cautious when we're looking at data specifically with two variables that a correlation does not imply causation. We never say something is causing something. We're just saying there's an association with it. Uh, let's look at graphs that uh, deceive. So looking at these two graphs here, in which graph did Honda seem to perform or outperform its competitors? And actually what's happening here is this is the same data set. It's really the same graph. What uh, this graph did here is notice that this one starts at 0 and this one starts at 30. So if we actually chop this graph right here and zoom in on this top portion, that's really what this graph is over here. So uh, if we truncate something or we don't label uh, the axes properly, uh, it's able for us to kind of get some different conclusions. So on the first graph, it looks like Honda outperformed them by a lot. But in reality, it was fairly, fairly close there. So depending who you're working for, um, you know, which graph you show could be the difference between getting your promotion or not. Here's another graph, and this should be a little bit disturbing here. And we're looking at median incomes by gender. And so what we see here is that the male income is a lot larger than the female income. So if we take just one of these at random here, look at this gap right between them. So that's fairly large, and it happens for all of these here. So if we look at that now... Alternatively, what if we did not record the males? What if those purple graphs were gone and all that was here was the pink graphs? Well, notice how they are steadily increasing. So if we don't put the purple graphs there, if we just only put the female graphs, we could say that female income has been steadily increasing. That's a good thing. Again, we're not necessarily lying, but we're being selective at what data we're representing there, right? What information. So we want to be very cautious with that as well. Here are a couple of graphs. Uh, the top right one here. Um, and if you notice, what's wrong with this is that it does not add up to 100%. A pie chart should add up to 100%. This data is pretty meaningless there. Um, what about that bottom one there with these percentages? And not necessarily that they don't add up to 100, but notice the, the category, somewhat likely, very likely, not very likely here. So these are only the ones they're asking uh, which one's falsified. So they're only looking at the ones that did falsify. It's possible that the ones that did not falsify were 98% of the data, and this is just a small part of that. So they're only looking at the yeses in this case here and not the noes. Here's another one here. And it's a similar to the other graph. If you look at the first one, there are no units on the y-axis right here. So they truncated it again. They zoomed in. So it makes those differences seem a lot larger than they actually are. The bottom one, a bit more accurate. You could see it's actually at zero there. And then this graph here, the top one. I would venture out to say that it's just completely wrong. Larger one should be a larger bar graph. Uh, the bottom one here, not as obvious, but if we look at some of these values, uh, 8.6 should be lower than 8.8. .8. So this one's just kind of plotted incorrectly there as well. So we want to definitely make sure that we're cautious of that.
And so these are some examples of just some misleading uh, graphs or deceptive graphs.